More than a half year into Russia's invasion, Ukraine finally began its counterattack to reclaim eastern sections of its country. Interestingly though, Ukraine has not yet touched what might be Russia's biggest vulnerability in the region, the Crimean Bridge, also known as the Kerch Bridge. Opened in 2018, it is the main artery for human and material movement between the Russian mainland and the annexed Crimean Peninsula. Moscow was more than willing to pay the $3.6 billion price tag for the bridge because it is critical to the survival of Crimea as a Russian physical possession. It is also a significant engineering feat, spanning more than 17 kilometers and securing its place as the longest bridge in Europe. And yet, it just sits there. Ukraine has levied some vague threats against it, including this cryptic tweet from August. But approaching seven months into the war, Ukraine has still not made a play on it. Maybe that will change eventually. But for now, it's worth asking why it has remained untouched thus far. Well, here are 10 reasons the Crimean Bridge is still standing. Number 1. Difficulty. To destroy a bridge, you first have to be able to hit the bridge. This is easier said than done. The bridge rises above water, so a naval assault may seem sensible. But it is a long distance from ports that Ukraine still controls. And there is a small problem that Ukraine lost its navy when Russia captured Crimea back in 2014. So the sea option is sunk. What about artillery? US shipments of HIMARS changed the face of the war allowing Ukraine to strike Russian bases deep beyond the front lines. However, the specific type of HIMARS the United States has donated to Ukraine have an effective firing range of 92 kilometers. If you plot that out from the closest part of the front lines to the bridge, you don't get very far. There is a second type of HIMARS rocket that has a 300 kilometer range. That actually gets you past the bridge with lots of room to spare. However, the United States has declined to give such military aid thus far. Washington wants to limit escalation with Russia. A 300 kilometer range rocket can also hit all sorts of targets within Russia proper, and the US does not want to be politically responsible for that. The remaining option is to bring in the Ukrainian Air Force. This is possible, but it is still asking for a lot. Russia is fully aware of the possibility of bombs or missiles raining down and has installed anti-aircraft defenses around the bridge. Never mind the long pathway over hostile territory the planes would have to successfully traverse to even get there. The bridge itself is thick, so minor hits will not be enough to destroy it. Though even some damage might stop the flow of traffic for a while, which at least would be a partial win for Ukraine. But like every other decision in war, the right question to ask is not whether attacking the bridge is possible, but rather whether it is the best target. The bridge does not directly kill Ukrainians, though eliminating it would make resupplying the southern lines more difficult for Russia. But Ukraine has proven its ability to hit purely military targets closer to the front line at a substantially lower risk. That appears to be a major reason why Kyiv has not yet gone for the deeper target. Number 2. The one-time cost problem. One of the great paradoxes of war is that once you have destroyed something, you can no longer use it as leverage against your opponent. If the bridge is taken out, Ukraine can no longer say, leave the mainland or we will destroy your precious bridge to Crimea. Because, well, that already happened. Leaving it to linger in the back of the mind of the opponent may be a better idea. There is a great story about this from the Yom Kippur War that may or may not be true, but it does illustrate the point. Allegedly, Israel flew over the Aswan Dam in Egypt and bombed it. But just with paint. No explosives. The message was clear. If the war continues, Israel has the ability to bomb it for real and destroy the dam. This would then cause untold economic damage to Egypt by flooding the Nile River Valley. Think of this in terms of our best friend, lines on maps. 
Imagine that this is the expected division a war will ultimately produce between Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine can hope to coerce more out of a negotiated settlement because Russia will not have to pay the further costs of fighting. Thus, this red line is the best feasible outcome for Ukraine. Now suppose Ukraine destroys the bridge. Russia has absorbed the cost of war and cannot recover it. So the red line shifts northwest, putting Ukraine in a worse position. In contrast, suppose Ukraine focused its energy on hitting a military target. That moves the expected outcome favorably for Ukraine and pushes the red line with it, thereby increasing Ukraine's bargaining leverage. Coercively, the second option is superior. The only caveat here is that the Crimean bridge is actually two bridges, one for vehicles and one for rail. Ukraine could try to destroy one without destroying the other, but that's still half the cost that Russia can never recover. The bridges are also parallel to each other, so only hitting one would require immense precision. Number three, tit for tat. Although it may seem strange, restraint in warfare is commonplace. Perhaps the best known example of this occurred during World War I, when soldiers in opposing trenches deliberately aimed in predictable patterns so that the other side could say not today to the god of death. This worked because the other side would reciprocate, and any violations would be punished tit for tat. The pinnacle of this cooperation was the Christmas truce in 1914, when the opposing sides rose from their trenches and spent the holiday fraternizing in no man's land. Similar restraint can arise at the strategic level. Russia and Ukraine fell into something that looks like that after the opening months of the war. Kyiv is no longer under direct invasion, and shelling in the West is rare. Life is beginning to look somewhat normal, as strange as that sounds. What we might be observing is tacit cooperation. But if Ukraine hits the bridge, Russia's tit-for-tat response may put Kyiv back in the crosshairs. Thus, perhaps the bridge remains standing because Ukraine wants to avoid that response. Number 4. Monitoring. This may only be a small factor, but the bridge simplifies the work of Western intelligence. The only convenient way for military equipment to enter Crimea from Russia is to go over the bridge. Presumably, U.S. satellites in the vastness of space are constantly monitoring the bridge, tabulating what's coming in and forwarding that information to Ukraine's military. Destroying the bridge would force Russia to change its strategy. Everything would have to come in by boat and could enter in a number of different other locations. That will make everything more difficult for intelligence to track. Obviously, moving things without the bridge would be less convenient and more expensive for Russia. You can't just drive them anymore. The point is that Ukraine does not internalize the full benefit. In the presence of the other issues on this list, intelligence could be the tiebreaker. Number five, escape route. For the next few possibilities, let's assume that Ukraine thinks that Crimea is in play. That is, the counteroffensive won't just get back to the January 2022 borders, but possibly the 2014 borders as well. Winning that back in battle would be great for Ukraine, but winning it back at no cost would be even better. However, that requires the other side to have a pathway to retreat. Otherwise, with their backs against the wall and concerned about the risks of surrendering, the opponent is liable to fight to the very last bullet. Crimea, being a peninsula, leaves Russian soldiers with nowhere to run, at least not naturally. But as long as the bridge stands, soldiers have an easy out. Get in a vehicle and drive to Russia. If Ukraine would prefer not fighting an enemy with its back against the wall, keeping the bridge up is the right call. Number 6. Population Sorting On August 6th, explosions rocked the Saki Air Base in Crimea, apparently destroying a handful of Russian planes in the process. Crimeans took this as a wake-up call. The peninsula was in play for Ukrainian attacks. 
The Crimean Bridge promptly set the record for the most vehicles crossing the bridge in a single day, presumably Crimeans fleeing for safer grounds in Russia. This is helpful for Ukraine's long-term control over the peninsula, as it sorts between Crimeans who look forward to Kyiv reasserting control and those loyal to Moscow. Having the hardliners gone simplifies the political process for Kyiv. Obviously, all Crimeans are at a personal risk of an errant missile striking their home if they stay. It's just that Ukrainian-leaning Crimeans have more reasons to stay, never mind not go to Russia, if they think Kyiv is about to send an army their way. Destroying the bridge would significantly raise the cost of evacuating for Russian-loyal Crimeans, as they would have to fall back on an inefficient ferry system that predates the bridge. Number 7. Civilian Casualties The fact that the bridge is being used as an escape route immediately creates another problem. There simply isn't any way Ukraine could destroy it without risking civilian casualties. Western partners would not be pleased with that, nor would it be a good look for moderate Crimeans still living on the peninsula. And speaking of those people, number 8 is maintaining the moderates. Crimea has always been politically unique within Ukraine. As the Soviet Union was breaking apart, Ukraine held a referendum on whether to declare independence. It was not close. 92.3% of the vote returned a yes. Within mainland Ukraine, every subdivision overwhelmingly agreed. Even Luhansk and Donetsk, the Donbas Oblast at the source of the 2014 conflict, were both a shade under 84%. That's a ton. But Crimea and Sevastopol City, its own subdivision on the peninsula, were way lower at 54% and 57%. This is a legacy of how Crimea was a part of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. That changed in 1954 when Nikita Khrushchev transferred it to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. Nevertheless, the seat of the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol kept a constant stream of Russians moving to the area in the decades afterward. All told, even in 1991, affinities for Russia were higher in Crimea than the rest of Ukraine. This meant that Russia faced little resistance in 2014 when it annexed Crimea to lock down control over Sevastopol. Now, there was what was likely a sham referendum that year, which saw 95.6% of Sevastopol and 96.77% of Crimea vote in favor of joining Russia. However, Western polling indicated that Crimeans broadly believed that the outcome reflected what a majority of them preferred. The point here is that politically winning Crimea is not a straightforward task, even if all the Russian hardliners flee across the bridge. Moderates that stay may very well have an interest in continuing to travel to Russia. Some, for example, may still have family there. Destroying the bridge is a bad way to get buy-in from that group, as Ukraine tries to re-establish governance over the peninsula. Number 9. Ukraine wants it too. Destroying the bridge doesn't just hurt Russia. It would also eliminate an enormously valuable piece of infrastructure for Ukraine, should it retake Crimea. Before Russia annexed the peninsula, Kyiv had agreed to work with Moscow on the construction of a bridge to span the strait. There was disagreement on where exactly to construct it. Ukraine wanted a more northerly route, but now Ukraine has a bridge built that it did not have to pay for. It may be years or decades, but eventually relations between Ukraine and Russia will normalize. Putin falling from power may be a prerequisite for that, but in a world where Ukraine has retaken Crimea, that is a likely possibility. Whenever that happens, Ukraine would directly benefit from the quantity of trade that would flow across the bridge, as well as Russian tourism flowing to the peninsula. Russia would suffer the short-term punishment for a destroyed bridge, but the long-term loser would be Ukraine, if Ukraine were to emerge from the war in a better position than January 2022. Finally, number 10, a negotiated settlement. Now suppose that Ukraine is less optimistic. 
retaking Crimea is unlikely, but military estimates still indicate that Ukraine can succeed in restoring its pre-war borders. From Russia's perspective, the primary military goal of the war following its failure in Kyiv has been to secure a land bridge. This runs along the Sea of Azov's northern coast, ending at the peninsula. Part of Russia's motivation here is because the eastern parts of the country have a higher density of Russian speakers, with outright majorities in Crimea, Donetsk, and Luhansk. Part of this is geographic convenience for military planners. Part of this is because it gives Russia control of the Crimean Canal, guaranteeing that much-needed water flows into the peninsula. And part of this is because having more paths into Crimea is better than fewer. Negotiating to the January 2022 border may not be ideal for Russia, but the bridge still allows for convenient resupply. Take away the metallic bridge, and suddenly Russia becomes less willing to part with its precious land bridge. The ferry system that predates the metallic bridge just will not cut it. It cannot handle the necessary traffic flows, and it cannot operate in bad weather. By this logic, the bridge remains standing because it makes Russia more pliable in negotiations over the territory that Ukraine cares the most about. And that's 10 reasons the Crimea Bridge is currently standing. Why do you think Ukraine still has yet to target it? Let me know in the comments. And if you want to know more about the war, you will love my book specifically on the causes of it. Check below for more information on that. If you already have read it, please leave a review. It really helps. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And I will see you next time. Take care. I'd like to think that the director thought they were getting a really awesome shot here but then got to post-production and noticed that a bird is trolling around in the background. Hey, come to think of it, perhaps this is a Russian sabotage operation.